Hello and welcome back. Today I'll be attempting to make a zinc acid battery in order to power some small devices here on the Matt Yasa channel. And so I'm starting out here with the borosilicate tubing I cut down in the last video using my wet saw. I'll go ahead and close one end of the tube to hold the contents of the battery. I'll heat the glass to a molten state and then use my tweezers to move it around until it's all closed up. One problem I'm facing already is that the tubing is too short. So I'll have to use the claw grabbers, which means I won't be able to blow into it. Which I would normally do to help even out the wall thickness by blowing it out, heating it back, and then blowing it out again a couple times. And so instead, I'll just have to apply a lot of heat and even rotations. And now I won't be able to get it perfectly even with this method, but I'll be getting close enough so it won't crack in the kiln. And now I'll move on to the next one. However, I'll use the second stage of this torch as well. The second stage will add more fuel and oxygen around the outside of the flame. This will increase the volume of heat, however, not the temperature. The temperature is more dependent on the purity of oxygen along with what fuel I'm burning. So increasing the purity or switching to a fuel like hydrogen gas would give us hotter combustion. And so the second tube is melting a lot faster than my first. It's more efficient to match the flame's size to the diameter of your work. When it's a bit too small, you'll start to radiate a lot of heat out of the areas not touching the flame. And so it can take a lot longer using that smaller flame, especially if you want to make some large work. But it is a good practice flame to start out with. And if the flame is too large, well, it's just kind of a waste of fuel. And so with these multi-stage torches, you can really set whatever flame you need as your work gets bigger or smaller. Now that it's closed, I'm gonna pull a little bit of glass very evenly out from the center. This is gonna be the last thing I can do to even it out before I apply that very hot heat. And now I'll go ahead and liquefy the end of it here. That way it can flow around more evenly which again is important to prevent cracks. As the glass heats up, it undergoes thermal expansion and actually increases in volume. While doing the opposite as it cools, it contracts and reduces in volume. So having two areas of different thickness will cause a difference in expansion and contraction, which can build up in stress until it cracks. And so they'll go in the kiln at 1050 Fahrenheit for two hours. And then they'll slowly cool back down to room temperature over the course of an additional five hours. And so now for the interesting part, I'm going to go ahead and attach all these together by hand. I'll connect them using the bridge technique instead of attempting to melt the sides directly together. If I try that, there'll be a good chance I won't be able to fully melt it in all the way down. And so any areas that are only halfway melted in would react the same as a crack would. Almost like that perforation they put in the top of a package so you can rip it open easier. It acts as if it has that perforation and the thermal expansion will cause it to rip. I know that sounds a bit strange, but I do like to compare different areas of physics together to get a better understanding of what's going on. And now as I'm comparing the different tubes together while I'm assembling it, I notice they are of different heights. I did measure the tubes as I cut them. However, it's been a little more difficult with the flame. 
The claws don't give me as much control, and I wasn't able to puff out the bottoms. And that's okay if it's not too pretty. Its purpose is to produce power, after all. And now that I have all four tubes connected with at least two bridges, I can go back and remelt each bridge individually to make sure it flows more evenly. I'll move it in and out of the flame very gently like this to slow down the heating process. This is something I picked up with soft glass in order to keep the rods from exploding anytime I put them in the flame. Soft glass will react much more violently to thermal stress. It's a much more difficult glass to work with. And now to make this a more proper experiment, I would have tested it in smaller steps first. Mostly by testing a single cell before attempting to assemble a six cell battery. But for video production, I often like to accelerate the process. It helps the process go more quickly, but also leaves a chance for a critical failure as well. Which I feel makes it a bit more exciting for the video. I have no idea if this will even work. However, I actually did test the concept out on a potato. I had my nieces over and we attempted an experiment of our own, the potato battery. Using five red skin potatoes, we were able to very faintly power a low power LED. And so you're probably wondering, how do you make potato power? As far as I've been understanding it, the power comes from the zinc, not the potato. The zinc will actually begin to break down into the acid of the battery. As this happens, the zinc enters into the acid while leaving behind some of its electrical charge, some electrons, which makes the zinc electrode, the bolt here, become electrically charged. And now we also have another reaction happening with the copper electrode. Some of the electrical charge, the electrons, begin to leave the copper electrode to form hydrogen gas using hydrogen atoms found in the acid. The last part of this reaction happens when we attach a wire between the zinc electrode to the copper electrode. The extra electrons in the zinc will begin to flow through the wire to replace the missing electrons in the copper. And like a river, we're able to harness that flow of electricity. Ooh. And so the wow. intensity, the voltage, depends on which type of metals we choose, along with the purity of the acid. If that sounds familiar, it is very similar to combustion. And so the volume of energy, the amperage, is dependent on how much zinc and copper is there very similar to how much fuel we add to the flame. So 1.03 volts. And now in order to validate that information to make sure it's correct, I'm gonna run several different tests. I swapped the copper coil out for copper washers as they're a little easier to work with, but I'm starting out with pure vinegar. Next up will be a diluted vinegar with 50% water. So I'm assuming it's gonna have half the voltage, 0.5, we'll see. And as I'm hooking it up, it comes out to one volt again. That's not what I expected, that's strange. I must have a slight misunderstanding with the purity or the acidity. Let's check out the next one, which is pure lemon juice. Lemon juice should be a little less acidic than vinegar. And so this reading actually seems correct. Let's go ahead and try the diluted lemon juice by 50% water. And I seem to be getting the same reading again, like the first vinegar dilution. So there seems to be a correlation to the purity problem. Let's go ahead and move over to pure water. 
And surprisingly, I get one volt as well. I am using different corks, so I'm not transferring the solution between containers. This last one has two of the same electrodes, both zinc, no copper. So we'll test if that theory is true as well, which it seems to be holding true. This is what I would expect. And so overall, I seem to have a misunderstanding with the purity, or there might be a slight problem with the battery. I know this is not the most efficient design. The liquid electrolyte, the vinegar, is electrically conductive. And we have both ah. electrodes submerged closely within the same vessel. And so we might be creating too much of an internal circuit, which won't allow us to draw the power outside. And so for my next battery, I'll probably have to separate the electrodes and the electrolyte, but interconnect them with a device called a salt bridge. And now I'll go ahead and wire the three cells on both sides into individual series, which should give me two three volt batteries. And then I'll wire those two into parallel to double the amperage. Okay, the first test, a low power LED. Oh, and there we go, it's working. I officially made my own battery. The potato battery I was talking about earlier didn't really illuminate the LED. This one's probably 50 times brighter. So I consider this battery a success. Now the last thing to test would be its highest voltage by wiring all the cells into a series. Each electrode needs to be connected to the opposite electrode in the other cell. So zinc to copper, zinc to copper. Whereas parallel works the opposite, zinc to zinc, copper to copper. So five and a half volts. That seems about right from the results I had earlier. And now we've reached the end of the video. I want to thank you for joining me on this energized episode on batteries. Now, although I don't recommend you attempt this experiment, I will be doing another video shortly here on the lemon battery. So make sure you subscribe, that way you don't miss out on what's coming up next on the Matt Yasa channel.